stand up this morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 24. I want you to stick with me this morning. Listen, I, I, am, I, am, I come from a Pentecostal tradition, and I like to do what we call get after it. Thank you, Pastor Ethan. Give him a hand up to me if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. Pastor Ethan's a good servant. Give him a hand. He's an amazing servant. Thank you. And I enjoy preaching. I like preaching. I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy sweat preaching, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is today, I really have some things I feel like I need to talk to you about and uh, break down some things, go deeper in some things. So I need you to stick with me today. This is the kind of weather you want, might want to doze off. So if your neighbor goes to sleep, you have permission to nudge them and elbow them. Don't slap them too hard. But um, I'll tell you a funny story. I was telling some people the other day at our Valentine's thing. Growing up, my, or my dad was a youth pastor of a church in Oklahoma. He told me this story. They had a, a gentleman back then that would pray at the end of every service. Every service he closed in prayer. Problem is the man also had narcolepsy, and he would go to sleep during church. And so one time he starts snoring in the middle of church, and his wife elbows him in the middle of the sermon. He thinks it's the end of the sermon. He stands up and begins to play, pray the closing prayer in the, in the middle of the sermon while the preacher is trying to preach. So anyway, if somebody elbows you today, don't get up and start praying. Just sit there and wake up, okay? Amen. Proverbs 24, verse 3 and 4. Let's read this together. I want to ask you this question today. How are you building your house? How are you building your house? Proverbs 24, 3 through 4. Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. Father, when we come in, we come in here today hungry and thirsty. We come here because we want more of you. We realize that you are the bread of life. You are what gives us everything that we need. This world has nothing that can satisfy. But Father, you satisfy that longing inside our heart for more. That thing inside of us that we're created with that just that, that realizes there's more to life. And Father, today we come up to the table to eat and drink of all the blessings and the goodness you have for us. Because you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So Father, today I just pray that we leave here getting everything we need out of the service today in jesus name we pray amen and amen turn around high five three people and say you're not nearly as bad as your in-laws think and you may be seated Anybody here ever built a house or had a house built? Raise your hand, anybody? If you were married when you did that and your marriage survived, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good, amen. Miracles still happen. Um, the truth is this, when you're building a home, it, it, it's difficult because you have a lot of decisions to make. I mean, you've got to decide exactly how you want it to be. How do you want it to be laid out? How do you, do you want it to be multi-level home? Do you want two or three levels? Do you want you know, two-story home? How, how exactly do you want it laid out? How do you want the kitchen laid out? Do you want it where when you're cooking, people in the other room can look in there and see what you're doing? Or do you want a private kitchen so nobody knows exactly what you're doing until you bring the food out? Where do you want the, the table and the chairs? And how many rooms do you want? How big do you want them to be? How close do you want the rooms? to be together all these decisions have to be made and they can put a stress and a strain as a joke but truly they can't put that on a marriage but here's the question you have to ask yourself what kind of wisdom do I need to build this house and the truth is about you yourself and then also about your family I'm going to tie both of these in today and the truth is this about both of those things the Bible says by wisdom a house is built a home is built by wisdom and by understanding and by knowledge it is filled how many of you know there's a difference between wisdom understanding and knowledge do you realize that today that knowledge listen you can have all the knowledge in the world but not know how to apply it and have no wisdom I, there are some of the smartest people in the world that I've met that didn't know how to walk they, they couldn't have walked themselves out of a paper sack okay they didn't have enough sense to get out of a rainstorm they, they had great knowledge but they didn't have very much 
wisdom. And the truth is this, you can have a lot of knowledge, you can even have some understanding, but not know how to apply it. Listen, you can have the truth, you can know the truth, and you can be speaking the truth, but you can say the truth in the wrong way and not have the wisdom to know how to say it and when to say it. There are things that are true that don't always have to be said. Do you understand that today? Not because it's always true doesn't mean it has to be said in that moment. I'm preaching to myself right now and telling myself this. I told that guy after I said all that stuff on the, the, the van the other day, I looked at him and I said, I've learned over the years, my Nike tennis shoes taste good in my mouth. And the truth is this, there are times we say things, we say the wrong things, because it may be true, but it doesn't mean it's wise. The Bible says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Notice what it said, the fear of the Lord, not to be afraid of the Lord. The Bible says the children of Israel in, in Exodus were afraid of the Lord, and they ran from God. That's not the fear of the Lord, that is being afraid of him. God never called us to be afraid of him, but Moses feared the Lord, and Moses ran toward him, because Moses realized his presence was the only thing that was going to make a difference in their life and instead of being afraid of God Moses ran toward God because he feared him we are called to fear God not to run from him we are called to run toward him and the fear of the Lord means I have a holy awe and respect for him I go into his presence and I realize I'm not going to the presence of just anybody I am going to the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords he is holy and there is nobody else like him can you say amen and help me a little bit this morning that is the fear of the Lord and so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom so if you're gonna build the life you want if you're gonna build the home you want if you're gonna build yourself in the ways you want to you've got to have wisdom to know how to do that how do you know if wisdom is working in your life Jesus said it this way the Pharisees came to him and they griped about everything you know what Jesus I love this he got he got tired he got fed up tired of their griping and he said, you know what? Nothing pleases you guys. John the Baptist came, and he was singing a funeral song. I mean, he came, and, and you know what? He wasn't eating and drinking. John the Baptist abstained from everything, and you called him, and you said he had a demon. And then I come along, and I'm singing a wedding song. I'm eating, I'm drinking, I'm having a fun time, and you look at me, and you say, I'm a wine bibber, and I, I, I have friends, I'm a friend of sinners. And he says, in other words, nothing satisfies you guys. But he said this, but wisdom is justified in her children. In other words, wisdom is justified by its results. So my question to you is this, are you having the results you want in your life and in your home? And if not, what wisdom can you apply to your life so that you can become everything God has for you and so that your home can be built to be everything God intends for it to be? Can you say amen and help me this morning just a little bit? So three things about wisdom for building your home. Number one, recognize your season of life. Recognize your season of life. I had some people that I grew up with. They actually built my parents' home. The, the, the gentleman did. He had a home building company. And when all their family had moved out, they built a 10,000 square foot home. I went over to visit the house one time, and literally to walk from one side of the house to the other, I felt like I needed Google Maps, okay? Trying to figure out where exactly this huge house for two people and I finally said what's upstairs well that's going to be our grandchildren's playroom I thought playroom they got to play store I mean they got to play the whole level up here are you, are you kidding me and, and the crazy part was whenever they got ready to sell it they couldn't hardly sell it nobody wanted to buy that big a home because two people that empty nesters built a home that big that's kind of crazy in my opinion because understanding the season of life they were in when you understand your season of life you understand things change depending on where you're at. Listen to me. Me and Pastor Ethan understand this. We have babies. All of a sudden, do you realize when I was a single pastor, I pastored this church for most of my life single. When I was a single pastor, I pastored differently than I did when I got married and then now that I have a kid. I can't help it. There's nothing I can do about it. When I was single, if somebody called and said, you want to do something, you know who I asked? Myself. I looked in the mirror. Self, do you want to go do that? I sure do. Well, self, get out and do that. Go do it, self. Okay, that sounds good. Now, let me ask my calendar. Look at my calendar. Calendar, is there anything going on? No, there's not. Great. Self wants to do it, and calendar says it's okay, so let's go do it. All of a sudden, I get married, and now it's not looking in the mirror and ask self. It's called wife and say, honey, do we have anything this day? Can we do this? Now, it's child's here, and so now I don't ask my child where he's going to go, but I can promise you he tells me sometimes where he's going to go. 
Because all of a sudden, I'm at, we're, we're asking ourselves, okay, when do we feed him? Make sure he's fed before he goes so he's not a brat at the restaurant because nobody wants a screaming kid like that, right? So we make sure of all of that. We make sure all those things because now the season that I'm in in my life has changed. I'll be honest with you, as the 39-year-old man who's been single most of his life, who is an only child, it is not always easy to realize that the seasons in my life has changed, that I can't do everything I used to do. That's the way life is. One of these days, I'll probably be 85 the way that we're going at this point in my life. One of these days, the kids will be out of the house. And I'll go straight into a nursing home. No, I'm just kidding. But the truth is, one of these days, the kids will be out of the, out of the house and things will be different. You must understand the season of your life and live accordingly. If you don't understand the season you're in, you'll miss what God is doing. Or, you know what? You'll take for granted what has happened in that season. I have to be careful with my son because the truth is, I love holding him, but I want him to be a little bit bigger so I can hold him up. Because now when I hold him up, his head does all this and he's doing all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm, I'm like, can you just be a little stable? for me but the truth is when he gets to that stage I'm gonna say I miss those baby cuddles I miss him being smaller and the truth is if we're always worried about the next season we'll never enjoy the season we're in in the moment listen to me enjoy your kids one day you'll be able to enjoy your grandkids I love maybe it's because I've never talked about this kind of stuff but I was sitting on that bus and when I began to show pictures of Benjamin to everybody every day I would show pictures Sarah sent me and when I did all of a sudden the, pa- the grandparents on the bus began to talk and I never heard them talk about this but one of the guys said I love being a grandpa he said I love bringing kids to my house I love giving them all the sugar I can let them stay up late and sending them back home to their parents And one of the ladies said, oh yeah, she said, I'm Mimi. And she said, they'll say, at at, at their house, they can't watch TV. And she says, whenever the parents leave, I'll say, you're at Mimi's house. You can do what you want at Mimi's house. Come on, let's go here and watch TV. And and, and her son said, mama, you can't do that. And she said, I told you when you were your kid, my rules, my house, you live according to them. Guess what? Grandkids, my rules, my house, that's the way I'm going to live. The truth is, this understanding the season that you're in helps you not to take for granted what, listen, you need to understand God is doing something in your life right now. He's doing something in the season you're in. Some of you are in a great season. You feel like things are going great. Enjoy it. Enjoy the moment because the truth is there will be difficulties in life. Some of you are in a difficult season, but I got good news. It may be winter right now, but one of these days the sun is going to shine through and the green grass is going to begin to grow and spring is right around the corner. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning and you you need to enjoy the season that you're in. Amen? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Some of you didn't know this was in the Bible. You thought the birds wrote this, but this is actually in the Bible. You'll get that when I read it to you. Some of y'all know who the birds are, right? The singing group, not the animals. Okay. There, to everything, there is a season. A time for purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. We'll get to verse 5 in a few moments. But I just want you to understand today, there is times for everything in your life. That I believe that life is about seasons, cycles of seasons. And there have been times in my life where I felt like everything I touched turned to gold. I felt like everything was, I was in a good place and everything was good. The bank account had enough money in it and I wasn't worried about the bills and things were good. And there's been times in my life whenever I felt like everything I touched turned to ash and to dust. And I felt like things were tight and things were difficult and things were tough. But here's what the Apostle Paul said, I have learned to have a lot and I've learned to have a little, but I've learned in all things. Things to be content with where I am and I want you to know tonight whether your bank account is full or whether you're scared you got a rubber bank account right now and everything's bouncing the truth is this God is still good on the good days and the bad days God is still good and if you'll face the seasons of your life understanding that that listen I am going to be content where I'm at right now God is building my house God is building my family and I'm going to have wisdom to understand my kids right now might have a smart mouth but I'm going to pray they're going to grow out of that thing and I'm going to discipline a little bit to help that but I'm going to you know what I'm going to do I'm going to make sure that whenever but one of these days that season will be over with amen some of you parents older give us some little parents some help okay give us some help today maybe not some of y'all are saying I'll never grow out of that amen the truth is this when you understand seasons and no matter what's going on in your life you understand this is not the end there is something else to come amen number two 
you learn to build with grace. Listen to this letter that a, a, a son wrote his dad. Dear dad, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with mom and you. I've been finding real passion with Stacy, and she is so nice. However, I knew that you would not approve of her because of her piercings, tattoos, and tight motorcycle clothes. Also, she is much older than me. But it's not only the passion, Dad. She's pregnant. Stacy said that, she, that we will be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many more children. Stacy has opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. We'll be growing for it ourselves and trading with other people in the commune for all the cocaine and ecstasy we want. In the meantime, we'll pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so Stacy can get better. She sure does deserve it. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure we'll come back to visit you so, we can, so you can get to know your grandchildren. Love, Joshua. P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Jason's house. I just wanted to remind you there are worse things in life than the school report card that's on the kitchen table. Call me when it's safe for me to come home. How many of you know sometimes in life you need grace? Amen? Sometimes you need more grace than other times. But you need some grace in your life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. I love this. In, first, in, excuse me, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how you ought to answer each other. Each one. Let your words be, have grace. Let it be seasoned with salt. And the truth is the way we speak to each other. I'll speak briefly to husband and wives this morning. If you're married, husband and wife, you're in a relationship today. If you want to be in a relationship one day, listen to this advice. The way you talk to each other matters. The way you talk to your kids matter. The way you speak about them and over them matters. That we need to have speech that is full of grace. That doesn't mean that people just do whatever they want whenever they want. What it means is this, that I began to understand that God looked at me whenever I wasn't perfect. I didn't always get it right I didn't always do what I was supposed to do but in the middle of that because of the grace and the goodness of God he loved me in spite of that and he forgave me and I am called to love and forgive others I am called to allow grace to come out of me that's what wisdom says amen wisdom understands this not every person is the same and so how you respond to people is different based on them and their personality. You need to learn that. You can't just say the same thing to every person. And a wise parent understands every child is different. Children have different personalities. What worked with one child might not work with another child. There may be one child that you look at and just your look is enough to straighten them up. There may be another child you have to implement some kind of discipline. It's not because you love one more than the other, but you understand their personalities and how they work and how they function. And wisdom says, I, here's the knowledge, but here's how I'm going to apply it. I am going to build with grace. I am going to love you with grace. I am going to speak to you with grace. I am going to understand who you are and how you operate. There are some people, they are straight shooters in life. They want everything told to them just like, I mean, you tell them the truth like it is and they love it there's other people think they're straight shooters but if you told them like it was the truth is they would get offended and run out the door and when you understand how people operate and you understand wisdom wisdom says listen some of your bosses here today understand your employees understand how they operate it's not favoritism that you favor one over the other it's understanding how to speak to them with different personalities and different backgrounds and we have got to be people of grace listen god gave me grace and I need to give other people grace. Can you say amen? And then number three, we learn to walk in forgiveness. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter, or chapter three, but this is verse five. We read up to four earlier. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. In the Old Testament, there was this thing that would happen, and whenever, any time they would have a, a covenant, they would do something. This story comes from Genesis 31 between Laban and Jacob. Laban and Jacob have been out tricking each other. I told you this story not too long ago, but Jacob worked for seven years for who, what he thought was his wife, Rachel. He goes to bed after they get married. He wakes up the next day. I don't know how all of this worked in that country, but he wakes up and got the wrong woman laying next to him. 
Now he's got Leah. And so he's got to work another seven years to get Rachel, the one he wanted the whole time. There's a whole sermon in that if you understand that God opened the womb of, 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 of uh, Leah because she was despised and God closed the womb of Rachel. But I don't have time to preach about all that. But here's what happened. All of a sudden, Jacob and Lot are out tricking each other constantly. Jacob tricks Lot into getting better animals and they're fighting. And one day, Jacob decides, I'm tired of this. I'm leaving. I'm going to flee with my wives, my animals. I'm getting out of here. So in the middle of the night, Jacob takes off and he leaves. And Laban pursues him. Laban's hot on his trail. And Laban wants to do all kinds of things to him. I mean, he just took his daughters away from him, his family away from him. Laban, I mean, he's ready. But an angel of the Lord visits him in the middle of the night and says, Laban, don't do to Jacob what you want to do. Don't do to him what you're planning to do. I want to stop right now in the middle of this and just tell you, maybe some of you are planning to do some things that you shouldn't do. And God is telling you today that marriage is worth fighting for. You may have plans tomorrow to go quit, and God says to you today, keep fighting. Maybe you have some plans to say some things or do some things today, but I want you to know that God has something good in store for you, and God just pauses for a moment to say, don't do what you're planning to do because God still has something better in store for you. And so in the middle of this, they have been throwing stones at each other. I mean, Laban and Jacob have been throwing stones. You good-for-nothing father-in-law, you son-in-law, I mean, throwing stones at each other. And they've been offending each other. I can't imagine all they've been saying to each other. They have been casting stones. But all of a sudden, Genesis 31, something happens. The Bible says when they meet up, instead of fighting like they planned on it, instead of the violence that was planned to be there, all of a sudden, they began to do something. They began to gather the stones. I can imagine them in their minds going over here and grabbing it and saying, here's the stone where you offended me by talking bad about me. I'm going to grab that stone and I'm going to take it over here. Here's that stone where you said those things and you made me do some things I didn't want to do and you offended me. I'm going to grab this stone. And they begin to grab all these stones and put them together. All these offenses, all the things they had built up over the years, all of those things that had built up in their life, they've now gathered these stones and they put them and they make a heat pile out of it. And really, what they were making there was an altar. And what they were saying on that altar was, all the past, everything that we've dealt with, all the words that we've said, all of those things, we today are going to sacrifice them on the altar. We're going to give them to God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says they sat on the pile of rocks, and they began to eat together. In the Old Testament, eating was a sign of sealing the covenant. I love Old Testament. But they sat on a pile of offenses and they ate and they said, I'm in covenant with you. And I want you to know today, there's some of you, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your household, maybe your parents did this to you, but you had words spoken over you. You had things said about you. You had your, maybe your daughter or your son, maybe a relative that said things about you that hurt you deep. And you scattered stones and you said things about them. But God is saying today there's a time to gather the stones. There's a time to lay down the offense. There's a time to say, you know what? I am going to walk in forgiveness. I know what they did to me. I know what happened. But I am going to stop gathering and scattering the stones. And I'm going to gather the stones. And I am going to let go of all the offenses in my life that, that have caused. And I am going to let it go. And I'm going to sit on that thing. And I am going to make covenant. It, and I'm going to say today, you might have done all these things to me, but today I choose to walk in forgiveness. If you want wisdom today, you've got to let some things go. If you want your house to be a certain way, listen to me, if your house is built and you don't like something about it, and every time you walk by there, all you say is, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe we did that. Do you realize after a while, you're going to be so rejected about your house, instead of saying, God, I thank you. I've got a roof over my head. I am thankful. I've got a warm place to sleep tonight. I've got somewhere to be. And all of a sudden, it, it changes when you let things go. Here's what God says. Quit scattering the stones. Gather them and let them go. Three ways quickly we do that. Number one, you acknowledge your part in the conflict. 
you acknowledge your part in the conflict. This, you may say, I'm not talking about abuse here. Abuse is a totally different thing. I get that. But I'm talking about when you have conflict within a family or conflict within a relationship or conflict in your life, you have to acknowledge your part. The truth is none of us are perfect. Okay, none of us. And the truth is anytime you point fingers at somebody else, what's the old saying? They taught you in school, three fingers are pointing back at you. We need to stop pointing fingers, acknowledge our part, and say, you know what? If I had anything to do with this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you realize that that's laying down our pride? That is living in a place of humility and saying, you know what? You might have said it to me, but I don't know what caused you to say it. Maybe I did something I didn't know about. I will acknowledge the fact that I'm involved in this, and I will say I'm sorry. Number two, you need to abandon your right to get even. There's some people say, well, you know what? I'll forgive them, but I'm still going to sue them. I'll forgive them, but I'm still going to go after them. I'll forgive them, but I'm still going to do all these things. And listen to me as a Christian. When you come to know Christ, you abandon your right to always have to be right. When you begin to realize, you know what? I don't have to prove I'm right. Because here's what God says. God says this, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay them. It is God who is going to get the payback. It is God who's going to do that thing. We don't wish that on people. My point is, stop trying to do revenge on your own. Revenge is not a godly character, but instead. Instead, let God deal with it. Let God do what he's going to do. So you first acknowledge your part. You abandon your right to get even. And number three, what I've been saying, you apply God's grace. You say, God, I need your grace on this. The situation needs your grace. And above all, I need your wisdom. Will you stand up this morning?